All right. So hi, everybody. I think why don't we go ahead and get started? We're just past uh, the hour here. I'm sure more people will be trickling in. Um, so first and foremost, welcome. Uh, uh, let's see, some people are coming in. Uh, thanks to everyone for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. Uh, if you're looking for uh, the Zoom on discussing career paths in pediatric pulmonary medicine, you're in the right spot. If you thought this was a fancy football draft, uh, fancy baseball draft, you are not in the right spot. Uh, let's see. So uh, my name is Ben Nelson. I'm the program director uh, for the Pediatric Pulmonary Fellowship at Mass General for Children in Boston. And I currently serve as the president of PEPTIDA, which is the Pediatric Pulmonary Training Directors Association. So this session is being hosted by PEPTIDA. And, um, you know, I just want to take a minute here, introduce some folks. Um, I'm actually not going to introduce our esteemed panelists um, just yet, because I'm going to have them do that themselves. Um, but we do have a few people I wanted to mention. So uh, Dr. Liz Fiorino um, at the Zucker School of Medicine, uh, she's part of our Peptida board and has organized this event. So thanks, Liz, uh, for uh, putting every this great panel of speakers together. Uh, Steve Kirkby, um, down at the bottom there, is um, also a panelist, but a program director at Nationwide Children's is part of our Peptida uh, board. And uh, I think Dr. Leva Day joined as well as the program director, there she is, at Columbia University. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Uh, also want to thank Ali Khoury, um, who is our, uh, basically makes everything run smoothly and work. Uh, she's our liaison at American Thoracic Society uh, who helped organize all this. So thank you, Allie. Uh, we are recording the session. Uh, and so if people uh, need to hop off uh, or have colleagues who couldn't join us, uh, the recording will be available uh, uh, probably next week or so uh, after it's all edited. Uh, let's see, logistics. So. I would love to invite everyone, um, all of our guests, to turn on their videos if they feel comfortable and if they can. I feel like it adds to a really robust discussion. Uh, feel free to snack, drink coffee, eat uh, anything you like. And if you want, um, you could also rename yourself just to include your institution, uh, where you're from, so we kind of have a sense of where everyone's coming from, which might be fun. So we're going to start the session uh, by asking our panelists to spend a few minutes uh, telling you guys about their unique uh, career, um, their path, uh, where they've been, where they are now, uh, maybe offer some advice uh, to you guys. And then subsequently, I want to make sure we have uh, lots of time for discussion, uh, questions and answers. Uh, if people have questions or comments, uh, arguments, uh, or anything of the like, uh, please feel free to do one of two things. So you can either type a question or a comment in the chat, and we'll monitor that. Uh, but please also feel free to use the raise hand function, uh, and I'll, I can call on you. You can unmute yourselves and introduce yourselves and ask your question that way as well. Uh, I did see um, Dr. Chuck Esther join too. He's the program director at UNC, uh, who's also part of the Peptida board and joining us. Um, I would also be remiss to um, uh, not wish everyone a happy um, International Women's Day. Uh, and look at this great panel uh, that we have today. So it's very exciting. Uh, so why don't we go ahead and get started here um, just going around in no particular, oh, no, actually, you know what? Liz gave me alphabetical order to go around in uh, <laughs> so I don't get in trouble. Um, so Dr. Dieterding, do you want to unmute yourself and start? That's so Liz, you're always organized. <laughs> so, uh, hello everyone. Hello to my fellows. I see you. Uh, so don't page me, uh, right now. Uh, so thank you for inviting me to participate. Uh, I think these conversations are incredibly important. I, uh, my career has been influenced by people who have told me, uh, I think you'd be great at this. I think you can do this. Starting from um, 
medical school at a community medical school and residency where I did med peds when somebody said, I think you'd be a great academic pulmonologist, like really starting to like uh, say, I think you'd be a good doctor. All these conversations really provided um, the idea that I could do it. So I say this to you um, at, the, at the start of this conversation as someone who you are leaders now that influence different levels of learners that make an impact. And so those statements have had a lifelong impact. And I have people tell me surprisingly, like what you said mattered. And usually it had to do with building confidence, finding confidence in them that they could do something. And so that's been very important in my career. I just thought I would call it out. I think that's really important for everybody, but certainly women. so I am uh, the, the chief of uh, pulmonary and sleep medicine at the University of Colorado, the medical director of the Breathing Institute at uh, Children's Hospital, Colorado. And I have a lot of titles and the medical director of the Innovation Center at Children's Hospital, Colorado. So I tend to like to do lots of things. Uh, so, and I, I get to do lots of things because I believe in building great teams and great leaders. So I, I've been here a long time. Uh, I'm a pediatric pulmonologist. I'm MedPeds trained. I came to Colorado to train. I was very, it was my dream job, uh, an opportunity. I like to be outdoors and I decided it was very gray in the Midwest, sorry, but that's what I decided. And then I wanted to stay here. Um, and I um, have had a fabulous career here that started out uh, moving into a basic science lab as part of fellowship. And what I will tell you while I start there is because every part of my career and careers have a rhythm, in my opinion, between five and seven years. Um, Every part of my career is is added to who I was. So in the basic science lab uh, where I did lung development and interstitial lung disease and met adult leaders in that field, uh, it, it laid the groundwork for what I really has been a lifelong trajectory of my clinical passion, clinical research in interstitial and diffuse lung disease. It started as a fellow for the people I met. Um, I then decided that the, for me, um, I, I come from a family of teachers that I wanted to pursue medical education and I did that. And I ultimately was in the Dean's office as the Associate Dean for Clinical Education. And that was good. We went through an LCME and that was good. And for a multitude of different reasons, some of which were not pleasant actually, uh, I left the Dean's office and took a wonderful opportunity to build what I the Breathing Institute is today and have an opportunity to think about clinical care uh, on a broader level for kids with lung disease where I have been, uh, and then uh, stepped into the chief position, uh, and then ultimately innovation position. Uh, And so I have followed in my career opportunities. And uh, I will say early in my career, I'm gonna end with this, I was, uh, I didn't say yes to opportunities. I had a little bit like, I'm not ready. And, And early on as a junior, faculty member, um, you know, I would say I'm not ready. I had one experience that I'll share with you and then I'll stop because I think it's critical. Um, Somebody wanted me to talk to ATS, in fact, as a junior faculty member about ILD. And I actually had had a lot of experience. And I said, no, no, I can't possibly do that. I'm not ready. So they proceeded to go talk to one of my other more senior male faculty members who had no problem saying yes to anything. And he had no experience, in my opinion. And he said, Sure, I'll do it, no problem. And I was like so mad, I had to go in my room and stop being mad at me because I was like, I knew more than him. What was all that about? And in that moment, I realized that I could no longer do that. And and I didn't feel like I had the confidence in myself to do that, but I developed this. What would Jeff do? That was the guy who was a mentor for me. What would Jeff do? And so that I didn't have to worry about it. And so if somebody asked me a decision that I thought, I didn't let the thought cross my mind, like, can I do it? I just said, what would Jeff do? And if Jeff would say yes, I said yes. And then I'm like, oh no, I said yes. But don't be afraid. Don't sell yourself short. If people think you can do it, you can do it. If you have to pick somebody else to say, what would they say, do it, but go for it. And you have a great career. That's my advice. That's great. That's really great. I I love that. Uh, especially the, hey, wait a minute, I know more than that guy. <laughs> All right, uh, Dr. Kirkby. Wow, that is a tough one to follow, Dr. Dieter Ting, as someone who has heard you speak and 
admired your work uh, when I was a fellow and as my career, I, I remember thinking and seeing you at uh, poster and not poster at platform presentations at TS and otherwise. So uh, wow, this is big, big shoes to, to, to follow here. Um, my, my name is Steve Kirkby. I am, um, as Ben said, I'm the fellowship director at Nationwide Children's. I'm also our medical director of our lung transplant program. And um, I guess to keep things pretty brief, my uh, initial interest in pulmonary started when I was about eight. Uh, I had terrible asthma, was in and out of the hospital all the time, and was one of those rare people that knew from a very early age that I wanted to be a doctor and actually I wanted to be a lung doctor. Um, but my career has taken some twists and turns. Um, when I was uh, going through medical school, I couldn't decide between taking care of adults and kids. And so I decided to do both, did med peds. And then I couldn't decide during that four-year residency to limit between adults and kids in pediatric pulmonary. And there was this whole thing of cystic fibrosis patients getting older and older and older and people needing to take care of them. And so I was crazy enough to do a five-year adult and pediatric pulmonary and critical care and pediatric pulmonary fellowship. And it was during that time, actually in year four and year five, that I discovered my love and interest in transplant. And um, so I went into pulmonary thinking asthma and I have a few asthmatic patients and I do a little bit of general pulmonary now, but uh, my career and one of the reasons why I'm on this panel is to point out um, opportunities to develop sub areas of expertise in clinical areas or research areas. And um, so most of my clinical time right now is focused on um, lung transplantation and advanced lung disease. So um, I'm going to leave it at that and let other people share their backgrounds too. Great. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Dr. levinsky Desir. Hey, everyone. I'm Stephanie levinsky Desir. Uh, one of the nice things about being in the middle is uh, it's interesting because things that both Steve and Robin uh, shared resonate with me a lot. And so much like Stephen, I am uh, one of those people who suffered from asthma at an early age. And around the age of five, I told my mom I wanted to be a pediatrician and sort of never looked back from that, that point and just kept going, going, going forward. I'm currently, um, as of about a year ago, the chief of pediatric pulmonology at Columbia University Medical Center in New York City. Now, if you ask me, 10 years ago when I finished my fellowship training, would I be the next chief of our division? I probably would have laughed in your face. And so much like um, what Robin was saying about how sort of not feeling ready and are you ready yet? Um, I, this, this job that I took over in the last year is, has very much been a leap into, I'm not sure if I'm ready, but what was the name of the person? What would, uh, what would Jeff do? Jeff do. <laughs> I guess I said yes. Jeff might have said yes. So, um, you know, what's what I love about uh, this field that we all have chosen and hopefully uh, many of you will continue to pursue and thrive in is how it does afford so many different pivot points and turns and, and opportunities. And if you are in this early stage in your career, feel like you have everything mapped out and planned out where you're going to be in 10, 20, 30 years from now, you might lose out on opportunities and, and potential things that could enrich your experience. So right now I spend, you know, I see uh, patients, I, I still have an affinity for children with asthma. So a lot of my clinical panel is made up of children who have asthma. Um, I also spend a good portion of my time doing research. I'm very involved in um, NIH funded research and others so looking at environmental exposures, air pollution, and things in urban communities and settings that contribute to respiratory disease in children. And now I have also this administrative responsibility that to me is an opportunity to uh, really advocate for other people who are in our discipline and our field and, and my institution um, and think about how can we sort of like elevate our, our field in, in general, which I, I think is a great opportunity to be able to, to have a seat at the tables that, that can help move those agendas forward. And then I've also done a lot of work within the American Thoracic Society. I'm very involved as the vice chair of the Health Equity and Diversity Committee. I've been involved in 
different aspects of the pediatric assembly. And so it's nice to be able to wear a couple of different hats, uh, do a couple of different things and, you know, spend more or less time in one area or another, depending on where the opportunities lie. So I think my biggest um, advice for all of you is to not try to be too perspective descriptive in where you plan for your future. It's nice to have goals, but it's also nice to keep yourself open because if you're too narrow focused, um, you may miss out on some opportunities that could really enrich your career. Thanks. I think that's great. I, I forgot to mention full disclosure. I too had asthma uh, when I was young. I feel like I need to share that. I was actually on Theophylline. I laugh with some, uh, some <laughs> of my patients because uh, no one knows what that is anymore. Uh, but anyways, uh, Dr. Rama. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Rama, Jen Rama. I am over in Houston at uh, Baylor College of Medicine, Texas Children's. Um, I am the program director of the fellowship. I do see some familiar faces. I do remember some of you interviewing. Um, I'm a general pulmonologist. Uh, when I finished fellowship, um, I actually joined a uh, master teacher program over at the med school just so that I could um, be more comfortable leading rounds um, right after I graduated. And um, teaching at the bedside. And then as part of this formalized program, um, which was just a certificate program, um, faculty development, which you know exists um, at most places, I, I discovered the field of education or like the science of education in terms of um, curriculum development and program evaluation and conceptual models. And so that kind of opened up my eyes. Um, to something that I, you know, never knew about before, and I had no intent to, you know, really pursue that um, at a more formal level. But I, you know, I ended up doing that. And so, um, while you all might know that having a niche in academics is is very important, um, um, as a general pulmonologist, um, I have a, you know, a different route. My my niche is in medical education, and so. Um, you know, can be considered non-traditional. Um, I have been promoted based on my medical education endeavors. I started out as an associate program director, then program director, and then over, like I was overseeing a departmental curriculum. And um, now I'm actually overseeing all of the fellowships um, in the department, which is a fairly new role for me. And it sounds very linear, but, you know, to be honest with you, like others have said, I my ambition was never to be a program director. I just didn't, I didn't, I didn't know. Um, and, and so as you train and you meet different people and you talk about different projects and you discover different realms within healthcare, um, just continue to be open and have a growth mindset. Um, and so the other thing I would advise all of you is, um, at least for me, when I was starting out in training, you know, I felt like I'm surrounded by all these giants, you know, everyone's really accomplished and everyone's really successful. I just don't know that I can, you know, I have that in me. Um, just remember that what you see is just the tip of the iceberg. I could probably tell you that most of us have a CV of failures to tell you about. You just don't, you just don't know about it. And so I'm happy to share it all with you if you want, but just remember that no one was, was born with, you know, what you think people with greatness, you know, it's, it comes with hard work and trial and effort. And I just want you to know that um, you'll get there and you just have to find your, you know, your peoples and your niche and your passion, and then it'll be much easier. Great. Thanks, Jen. Uh, Dr. Salinas. Hey, I'm Daniele Salinas. It's uh, good to see some familiar faces here. Um, I am currently, I was in um, a faculty at University of Southern California at Children's Hospital Los Angeles for 12 years. And then two years ago, I transitioned out of academic medicine and I'm currently working for Vertex Pharmaceuticals. 
And as a medical director, I'm in clinical developing, um, solely working on cystic fibrosis research. And if I look back, um, I would never think in a million years that I would be doing this uh, at this mid-career. Uh, but I think it aligned with um, what I always felt was my calling because I knew I wanted to be a doctor since I was six. And then that <laughs> very similar to some of your stories. And, uh, and, and the motivation that the driver was always about knowledge. And then when I entered residency and I saw I took care of my first cystic fibrosis patients, patient, I knew I wanted to go into pulmonary solely for the reason uh, to research uh, cystic fibrosis and find a cure for this devastating disease. So um, when I did my fellowship at University of California, San Francisco, I was in high throughput screening, working with finding modulators. And this was before a Vacafter era. And this was in early 2000. So um, Vertex was not even, you know, research in, in, in the research field of cystic fibrosis at that point. So it's just a full loop to, to be back. And then I remember having posters with modulators and testing these uh, drugs as a, as a fellow at UCSF, you know, with the uh, investigators that are now uh, lead investigators in the, in the Vertex, um, you know, company. So it's kind of interesting how things played out. Um, I did transplant uh, for a while, um, pediatric lung transplant um, at, at CHLA, and, and that was not a good fit for me. It was 100% clinical, and I knew I wanted to do research. So I found a way to do a master's in clinical translational research and went back from the basic science and fellowship back to do back in research, but in, in the clinical translational uh, field. And I think the, the advice that I that I have is really to look around where you are in the institution that you are and see what the resources are and use them all. Mentorship, courses, anything that it's additional to add to your career, to your CV. And I'm a big yes person too. So I believe that if somebody is inviting you and, and if you find the opportunity, take it, take it. And then deal with how you're going to handle it later, but just don't say no. And then um, I think that the calling and the drive, it's something that you have it, you know, that inner voice, listen to it. Because I always knew my, my, my role and my contribution to, to my field would be related to research. And I'm very happy right now that 100% of my time is devoted to, to clinical research. So I'll leave it at that. That's amazing. Um, we're going to open it up um, to our audience in a second here. I just want to kind of stress that, it, you know, it's, it's it always amazes me how many options and um, opportunities are available in the field of pediatric pulmonology. Uh, it, and I still don't think I know every, all the potential opportunities uh, that are out there, uh, which is, is very exciting, uh, I think. And uh, like many of our panelists said, it's it, career paths aren't a straight line. Uh, they go up, they go down, they go sideways, they go backwards and forwards all the time. Uh, and there's always room for growth and change. And so it can feel very daunting as a trainee figuring out, oh my gosh, you know, uh, there's no match system for getting a faculty position anywhere, or I need to negotiate. Uh, I've never done that before. Uh, or what do I even ask for? When do I start looking for jobs? All those types of things. Uh, so I think the experience we have here on our panel um, is, is amazing. So please take advantage of it. Uh, so feel free to either type something in the chat or you can, um, if anyone wants to, you just use the raise the hand function. Uh, we can call on you and unmute yourselves. There are, there's really nothing off limits. Uh, so anything that will be helpful for you guys, I'm sure someone will be happy to discuss. I, sorry, I just wanted to mention one other thing, if this is of interest to anyone. So as part of my innovation work, I'm, I'm a part of three startups and a startup and an academic career is really uh, novel. So if anybody wants to talk about that offline, I'm happy to do that. Very cool. Thank you. I know it's always hard. No one wants to be the first person to ask a question. Um, oh, we got something. All right. Cameron, I love it. Uh, during interviews, do you have tips for seeking out possible mentors. I don't know if someone wants to jump in and, and take that one. 
I can start with that one. I, I'm assuming that you're talking about interviewing between for like a first faculty position as opposed to this, uh, I, I think I know Cameron that you are a pulmonary fellow. So um, I think that a lot of the onus um, in a division chief or a person who is hiring you, um, a lot of the um, the response, it's the responsibility of that person to help you identify a mentor. Um, and that to me would res ring as a, a red flag if that hasn't been mentioned at some point during your interview process. So I think that while it's great to have a sense of who at the institution is aligned with some of your own career goals and things that you're interested in, you know, pursuing in your early faculty career, uh, the most important thing is really to ask the question of the people that you're interviewing with, specifically the division chief to say, you know, like, who do you see being a good fit as a good mentor? Because that's part of the job of bringing on a new faculty person is to ensure that person's success. So um, don't, I don't think it's all on you to sort of identify that person. Maybe others have um, opinions about how they've approached that. I would, I would add that I think a, a main primary mentor is important that it's maybe in your area of interest, but a mentoring team could be another approach because sometimes somebody who is of a completely different department has uh, more experience writing grants and, and, and getting funded, for example. So you want that kind of a skill from a different mentor or it's something that is more operational and knows how to run a lab or knows how to run a research team. So you want maybe a nurse in that position to be part of your mentoring team as well. And as a new faculty, depending on what uh, you want to focus on, you may need advice for more than just one person. So ask, asking for a mentoring team might be um, an idea. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Robinson. I uh, am at UT in Memphis. Kind of, I'm trying to think of the right way to formulate this. Um, so I know after I'm a second year, and I know after graduation, I'm going to be going to a specific geographical location because I'm going to be following my husband, um, who will finish residency this year and will be taking a position in ENT. So I know I'm going to be, I'm going to be wherever he's going. And it'll be where we grew up. But other than that, I really have never trained there, have haven't lived there since I graduated high school. And I don't and it's a bigger it's bigger city. Um, and so there are multiple different. There's really two main hospitals and then another one that's non academic uh, that does some contracting work. Does anybody have any recommendations as far as I guess how to reach out to different people in these positions um, that you really do not have any interaction with, have never known. Um, even for fellowship, I just applied to where I did residency so I could stay with my husband. So it's not something I've really interacted with other people outside of my institution. Um, and then from there, kind of without being there, how to get a groundwork or an understanding of the environment and how the different institutions work with each other without trying to um, uh, I guess try, trying to, you know, I, I hope everybody understands what I'm trying to say, like without trying to like step on toes or try to find out if there's some weird animosity between the groups. <laughs> I'm happy to start trying to answer your question. And I'm coming at this from the perspective of the fellowship director. So I know um, I, I think one of my responsibilities, I'm sure Ben and Oliva and uh, Jennifer, others, this role, I think we all feel like it is our responsibility to help our senior fellows and mid fellows um, look for the right job that that is, you know, their clinical area of interest, their regional area of interest, all those other factors. And so um, I know I starting in year two, talk with fellows about, hey, it's time to start looking where are you are there certain cities, certain places, certain states, are there certain career niches that you want to uh, approach. Um, but I, I guess, Amy, I recommend for you and for, for my fellows, I encourage them to reach out directly to division directors. Um, and um, Stephanie and Robin can give more perspective on that. I'm sure that they all division directors probably welcome emails from fellows saying that they're interested in learning more about job opportunities. 
Um, but I also think it's, you know, role of a fellowship director to help. Um, sometimes fellowship directors may know the fellowship director or the division chief and kind of make that conversation. Um, one of my highlights of ATS last year was sitting next to a division chief at another hospital. And I knew that my fellow wanted to look in that area. And I talked to her and said, hey, can you interview the fellow? The, the interview happened the next day and things have worked out. So anyway, I, I, I think pediatric pulmonary, one of the great things about it, it's, it's a relatively small community. A lot of people know each other. Um, I think everyone is really um, on the same page of trying to um, advocate for fellows and junior people finding the right jobs and, and understanding life, life factors. And you've got life factors with your husband, who's means you're going to be in a certain place. And, um, you know, I think I'm sure division directors would be very open to hearing about the fact that you're, you're going to be moving to their area and, uh, you know, would want to try to meet with you. So I, I had some comments about that. Um, I, I think the responsibility of fellowship director or chiefs, I mean, it is a small world. My, my phone has most numbers in it. Um, and if it does, and I'm sure that's the same for others. And I think we have to part the way for our trainees. Um, and so it, it, go to your chief or go to your fellowship director and say, do you know those people there? Can you introduce me? ATS is the prime time. Now that we're all back together again, that's where the matchmaking, you mentioned that, Steve, that's where the matchmaking happens. And so that you can ahead of time connect people so that these meetings can, can take place. And uh, so I would strongly recommend that. The other thing is there's some onus on you, though your career is not, it's going to change, it's going to do this, you have to have a starting point. So some of my fellows know I do this, but you know, what's your elevator speech about your career right now? I mean, as a chief, I want to know what you want. It matters to me that you're going to be in this location, but I still want to know what it is your career path is that you're passionate about. I'm recruiting a passionate uh, faculty member, and I want to know what matches with you and, and give me the elevator speech about what that is for you. Uh, because we, we think about clinical jobs, we think about special areas within clinic, we think about research positions, we think about, you know, we have all these different ways to match people, and we're looking for people who line up in those areas uh, and who could be excited about. So work on your elevator speech and uh, so that people can hear the prime things, and uh, your, your fellowship director and your chief should help you and then can connect you with your elevator speech to the right people. I would also add to that, that um, yes, while we always try and sponsor our, our junior faculty and our trainee and introduce you to people that um, we might know, if we don't know someone for you, um, that it's totally okay to reach out, especially because you have um, a geographic location you need to be in, to reach out to them and say, I'm so-and-so, this is my situation, um, I'll be at ATS. If you happen to be there, I'd love to, you know, have coffee with you. And so you can also initiate that, especially because you know where you need to be. Most of us will be at ATS and it's just, you know, it's, um, we're small and, and I understand that there's like, um, you know, a little angst to reaching out to someone that you've never met before, but if you just try it, there's really like, no one's going to bite. <laughs> so, yeah. And related to um, just a comment about the second part of your question about, you know, what is, um, you know, what are the, the politics? Sometimes it's kind of like a little uh, hard to get into. Obviously, you, you don't want to ask that in the you know, interview process, but there is a, a, a um, more um, productive way to, to put this question is in, in this institution that I'm, you know, applying for a job and then I'll be part of. What are the areas of improvement that you envision? Because you want it to be part of the solution, right? So you want to be, you want to add to your skills. You want to help the institution to improve, right? And knowing upfront what are the gaps and what are the, you know, uh, things that they need. You might be getting in uh, a situation where they will welcome you to fulfill that gap and to help the institution to improve. So I think that would be kind of like an initial uh, introduction to understanding the, the nuances and 
things that are not perfectly right with with that department, with that institution, because there's no such thing, right? We all know that um, life is not perfect and there is always room for improvement. And, and to know that uh, in the beginning of your, of your, you know, job, I think that that helps a lot because again, you can be part of the solution, you can help them. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. That was a great question. Um, Amanda has a question about um, uh, how do you advocate for protected non-clinical time? Uh, and I think I would add to that, what is an appropriate amount of time to add a protected time to ask for if you're trying to go towards a K grant or research or something like that? Uh, so what's an appropriate clinical FTE to ask for if you have those interests? This is a tricky question, and I think it can be a little bit institution dependent in terms of where you're looking, um, the type of institution, um, and, and sort of what the, the mission or the goals of the institution are. So I can speak for where I am right now and other centers that are probably similar to ours. Um, one of the important things, one of the important things that at, at Columbia, I think, is you thrive by with protected time um, by demonstrating that you can do something with that time. And we have um, fairly strict care model. Um, if those of you who haven't heard about a care model, I actually don't know if other how many other institutions use similar rubrics. So C stands for clinical, R stands for research, A stands for academic or administrative, and E is education time. And all of those buckets sort of need to add up to 100. And so people who come in with a larger bucket for research time, let's say, are often people who have demonstrated productivity in the research space, who may have applied for research funding as fellows and have gotten small pilot grants and sort of have demonstrated a track record for success in terms of funding that research time and space. And the more you can demonstrate that you've been successful in that path, the more likely you're able to, to advocate for a larger protected amount of funding for, for research, for example. And so a typical Ben asked the question, a follow-up of how much time is protected time makes sense. For most K awards um, that are funded by the NIH or other similar career development awards, um, somewhere between 75, 70% 70 protected time for research is, is what's given or what's somewhat funded in those positions. So someone who really wants to take off in a research intensive career, whether it be basic science, epi, um, translational research, clinical research, you'll want a, a large chunk of your time early on in your career to be able to focus on getting grants and writing papers and things like that. Um, that's been my path, but I know there are other people on this panel who have protected non-clinical time for other um, related activities. So maybe others can weigh in on that. Let me just talk from a chief perspective from, from uh, what I see. It's very confusing language. When you get out there, I recognize this early on. I'm like, what are they talking about? Like, what? They don't have more protected time than we do. This is my early chief experience. And so it, it's confusing how people will state things and they're not doing it purposefully. It's how their institution does it. So I think uh, Stephanie talked about the classic research per, per approach. That's it, 70, 75%, as well as some package to get started and a mentor because the institution, if they're recruiting you for research, they want you to be successful. And, and that's what you need to be successful in, in the straight research perspective. And if that's you, it's almost clearer. I mean, that's you, you need to articulate that, come in with, with those passions. And that's pretty clear to me. And if people, and you want that, people not talking like that, and you need a couple of years to have that, then rethink it. What the harder position is, is when you're not purely that path, that's when things get a little different because institutions, uh, the, the financial constraints are real. Um, and, Providing protected time outside straight clinical uh, recruitments is hard for our institutions. You can do it. You need to work with your chief. You need to really articulate what that could look like, like 
10%, 20% to do what programmatically to develop what, what would you bring there? It, it, you might get it for a little bit, but if you don't have a vision for what you're going to do with it, it's not going to go anywhere anyway. So, so I would think like that. And I do negotiate with people who have ideas like that, but I will say this, that like when you get ready to look for a job, if people say, oh, they have 20% protected time. Well, I could say that because our full-time clinical position is eight half-day clinics. That means you have 20% protected time, right? In, in, but, but see what I'm saying? I don't say that, by the way. But that people start saying that. I'm like, what? And But, but it does mean that you're in eight half-day clinics, which is a very good, solid, tr- and I think pretty common clinical load for full-time clinical. So that does give you a full day. But don't be fooled. That full day is full of you know, quality, uh, other ways you have to be promoted, meetings, catching up with Epic. And so th- that is really not where you're going to build a researcher programmatic uh, approach to it. So so just be careful with how people represent these things. And remember, I don't know if other people would agree with me, um, but it's very hard to get anything you don't ask for. Uh, you're not asking for the moon and asking for a million dollar salary, but at the same time, uh, it's it's foreign to a lot of us, especially if you've never had a job outside of medicine. Uh, this is the first time that you'll be doing this. Um, so uh, you definitely need to advocate for yourself. Uh, Can I just and- amplify something that Robin said, um, which is this idea that as you're looking for a job, it's really important for you to understand what it is that you are able to bring to that institution. Because most divisions, most organizations have gaps that they're trying to fill. And when they're looking at an applicant, they're trying to see which gap can that person help me fill. And there's one part of it that's really helpful to be specific about what you want to get out of it. But there's also Um, allow yourself to be somewhat flexible to be able to fill another gap that the institution might might have. And if you can make that connection, that in and of itself will really help with your negotiating power, because then you can stand on the footing of this is what I'm able to give to you. And this is something that you obviously need. And so um, I think that makes the negotiation a little bit more even. I don't know if Stephanie, if you were reading the chat, but that I think leads nicely into the next question of, you know, as an early faculty member, how do you say no to certain things uh, so that you can focus on your on your passion, but at the same time not close off doors to other opportunities that maybe you're not aware of? If someone had the answer to that, they would be like the Nobel Prize winners. <laughs> it's something that I think all of us struggle with. Um, you know, s- saying there's a balance and it might shift and change depending on where you are in your career. Uh, you know, I think that if some of you might have heard this from me before, but I think if you're still undifferentiated, you know, and, and you're still in that exploration phase, perhaps you're, you're, you might not want to um, say no as readily, you know, because you, you still need to explore. Um, however, if you're now more secure in a track and with your career goals, and you know that some activity that you're offered um, does not align with your career goals, and will actually distract or take away from your um, mission, then more likely you would want to say no to that. Having said that, if it's your department chair or your division chief and they're asking you for something, you you know, you also wanna take into account who is asking the favor and you wanna have some element of citizenship and some teamwork. Um, and to just kind of balance that with advocating for yourself in your time, because um, that's really your most precious commodity. Um, and so you can't do it. You can't do everything. You're, you're going to have to narrow it at some point. And so to keep yourself sane and mentally healthy, you're going to need to say no um, 
a lot. It just might depend on where you are in this stage of your career. And this is Liz. I know I'm not on the panel, but I just wanted to say, because I've definitely been the beneficiary, some known, and I think some like very God mentors. Um, you can also, and again, I think what, what Jen was saying is really important. If you're like kind of in that position where at least for the time being, maybe that five to seven years, you know what direction you're going in and you just can't take something on, think about the people who are like a couple years, five years, seven years, wherever you are behind you. And that's someone that you can suggest because it's always people are, and especially in our world too. And then when you get to subspecialties or sub sub specializations within each field, the field of people who are sort of devoted to that becomes narrower and narrower. And so people who are looking for people to do things are always really happy if you can suggest someone else. And I feel like that's a really big, and that's like, I feel like when you're mid-career, you're kind of shifting to not just looking at your own career, but then part of your own career is mentorship. And I think no matter what track we're in. So I just wanted to add that piece. Can I just add one more thing is that um, I think it's really helpful to have a trusted advisor or someone who you truly trust who has no skin in the game and is really like looking out for you. They might be at your institution, at a different institution. They could be a peer. They could be a near peer. And it's always helpful to bounce some of these things off of another person because there have been many times where I've been like, I got to say no to this. And then I just run it by somebody who's a little bit more senior who's like, you can't say no to that. And, you know, sometimes it's helpful to have a sounding board to help you vet. So never answer an email or make a decision yes or no within the first 24 hours. Make sure you sleep on it before you respond and then run it by somebody else who can help you make that decision. All very salient advice. Um, that, that definitely is true. You never have to answer right away. That, that's really key. Uh, so we have um, some people in our audience who are not um, as, um, finishing their fellowship, but starting it. Uh, so to that end, uh, when should people start thinking about looking for uh, positions and jobs? When is it too early? Is it not too early? Uh, when should people really engage in the process? What would you guys recommend? I'll start off with that. Um, Catalina, I think it's a great question. And I'm glad that we have first year fellows on this and um, you know, that you're soon to be a second year fellow. So time flies um, during your training. Um, I, I don't think it's ever too early to start thinking about what interests you most and what you feel like your strengths are and starting to have conversations about what that then looks like in, in terms of a faculty job. I think first year is probably probably a little too early to start talking to division chiefs. Uh, you still have a ways to go. Um, I know with our fellows, I really try to, in year two, so in their second year of training, I use ATS. I say at ATS, I really want you to kind of have a list of um, places, specific hospitals, specific uh, locations. And I kind of use the second half of year two to help fellows um, target some institutions to reach out to. And again, part of that is on the training. Part of that's uh, my job as the fellowship director and our division director and other faculty members who may know people at, at places where a trainee is, is interested in, in looking. So I think in year one, the, the key questions, particularly towards the end of year one, it's, you know, what uh, are there specific areas within pediatric pulmonary from a clinical standpoint that you're most interested in? Um, do you have particular academic interests? Is a research interest? Are you interested in medical education? This whole, whole huge spectrum of other things that you can do for a career in academic medicine. Um, it's important to start thinking about that and probably talking to your fellowship uh, leadership, your division leadership. And, um, you know, I think it's also an opportunity if you get a chance to go to ATS or the CF conference or CHESS, wherever you may be, you can start to, you know, hear and um, you know, listen to people from other institutions, talk to fellows at other institutions about what life is like there. You know, I think it's a time for building your interest. And um, but but then I think year two is really the year to start more focused, reaching out to folks. I think something that people don't understand is the onboarding process. And um, so it takes us about eight months to onboard you. And that includes uh, getting privileges, all your records, state medical licensing, even if you're local. So if you do the math, 
eight months backtrack, uh, depending upon your institutions. Now you're really into like, you got to be interviewing, you got to be getting your places ready. ATS is a great start because you're going to start the interview process summer into that fall. And depending upon the institutions you're looking at, those onboarding dates are going to be real because they mean if you miss the onboarding date, maybe you want to travel or whatever, but then you're going to have, you know, some time where you're going to have to think about a gap. So people don't often understand that. So I just wanted to mention that. Along those lines, as you got, as people are looking for that first job, um, what, what do people need to know? Uh, so they're interviewing for the job. What aspects of the job do you think that they really have to have a good understanding um, about, whereas other things may or may not be impo as important? Obviously, everyone has different interests and needs and wants and, so, and what's important to them. Uh, but do you have any recommendations on, oh, you're applying, you need to know X, Y, and Z before you can make a decision if this is the right position for you? Oh gosh, I'm talking too much. I'm going to just say my three rules. Okay, because they apply here and they apply anywhere. There has to be a position that the, that, the, that the program needs. That's what people are going to be interested in. It has to be a position that you want, that matches your passion. And then there has to be a position that develops you. I mean, these two things might be true, but if they don't have anybody that they don't have the resources and the and the way to develop you to be a national leader, don't do it. Those three things need to be in place. Uh, and that's a commitment a program should make to you. And I'll leave you with two other thoughts. One of your questions should be, um, you know, you're going to talk about what you're passionate about. Uh, if I come here, how do you see my future in 10 years here? Because you're really asking them what they're going, how they're going to develop you. I think you should all be asking that question. The second thing I would ask I don't, is I think all of you should be leaders. You should be asking about leadership development. We do not do that well in, um, as physicians, and you should be asking about opportunities for that for your career. Now, that's going to come back to haunt me. I don't care. I'm ready to answer the question. I would add to that. I think it's super important to understand what are the expectations of the division leader and the institution? What are they hoping you will accomplish or achieve for them? And to try to be as transparent and clear about that um, as possible. And that comes down to like, there are probably clinical needs. How many clinical sessions do you actually need me to do? Do you need me to grow a brand new practice from scratch? Or am I stepping into shoes of somebody who has a well-developed practice? And, you know, do you need me to grow a clinical program? Like this is, there's a gap that you guys haven't filled yet. And you're looking for someone to do that. Or um, those questions of really trying to understand what they need from you will help you to not only help meet those expectations if you do choose to, to step into that role, but also for you to understand, is that what you want to be doing? Because um, I've definitely had colleagues and friends who have looked for jobs and it's like, they, they're going to pay me so much money. It's great, but they need me to travel 30 miles to this clinic and then to that clinic and to be all over the place. <laughs> and, you know, if that's not teased out and you don't understand where and, and, and what needs the division has in advance, you might be um, disappointed when you step into that role. I just want to add, um, if any of you um, would have any interest in coming to uh, the industry side of things, the first job could also be a program that would actually expose you to different possibilities in industry and therapeutic development. So Vertex, for example, has a Vertex Physician Investigator Program. It's a two-year program where you actually have rotations in regulatory and clinical translational and clinical development. So you're actually exposed to different components of uh, developing therapeutics, which I think it's fascinating. And um, and they offer, Vertex offer this position for if you're fresh out of fellowship um, and you can just, and you're hired as an employee. So you can, after those two years, decide, no, this is not for me. I want to go back to academics or I want to go back to private, private practice or or have a, a different path, you, you're totally free to do so, but you're guaranteed a, uh, to be offered a spot after those two years as a more permanent um, um, uh, job. 
So just to give you that other possibility to think about. I was just going to add in um, one of my mentors who's now retired um, told me that um, all of us in academic medicine, he was focused on academic medicine, that that there are three main factors um, in his, as he described it. One was our job, meaning the patients that you see, the research that you do. So one is the job, two is the location, meaning is it the city, the state, close to family, what's best for your significant others, all those different factors. So the job, the geography, and then third is the money. And he said, most of us get two of the three. If you get a chance to get three of the three, meaning all of those factors are exactly what you want, that's that's a home run. Uh, and maybe something that we should all be striving for and hoping for. But he, he also shared it with me as kind of a, you know, it's it's a little bit of reality too, of that for most of us in academic medicine, it's two of the three. I think, frankly, most of us feel like as pediatric pulmonologists, we may not be compensated as much as what we think we are based on the work that we do and compared to cardiology and intensive care unit docs and other things where, frankly, they just make more money. Um, but but thinking of those two of two of the three, and if you only have one of the three, so if you're looking at a job and it's the right location, but it's you know not doing the, the things that are going to make you happy work-wise and not going to pay well, then maybe you ought to think more. So so that was important information to me. Make sure you get two of the three. Does anyone, uh, I actually don't know the, um, the uh, let's see, does anyone in, on the panel here have practice um, either working in private practice or community practice setting, um, or if not, can kind of contrast that with an academic institution? So I have worked in a community practice setting, um, employed in an academic center, that is, you know, we're tertiary, we're quaternary, but we have satellite clinics um, in Houston and neighboring areas. And when I was first hired, I was spending some of my time out there. And um, I think it's a great experience. You know, it, it was very different from what I was used to in terms of training because we had all the resources at the main campus, but I was in a satellite center. And um, at the time, I had an MA doing my PFTs, um, which were not high quality. And I had to learn how to you know, manage a busy practice with less resources. I had um, much more bread and butter cases, which is fine, but I was learning a different skill in terms of um, being more efficient with my charting and um, workflow. And it was still very useful in terms of learning a different model of practice with less resources. Um, and I enjoyed it very much. And so um, even though I'm, you know, in an academic center, I did get that community experience. And I think most, you know, or many hospitals will have um, satellite centers. And, and so that might still be, you know, a community job, but um, working academically. And in uh, Texas Children's, we do have like smaller hospitals and they're actually um, paid at a different rate and they have different expectations and productivity metrics and evaluation metrics than those um, at a different center. And so, um, you know, I think there is definitely many areas in which you can compare and contrast, but I, I think that you might be able to find um, a position where you have a blend. Um, it just really, you know, depends on on you and and like what was mentioned before, like what can you bring to the group and what does the group um, need? What is the demand for the position that you're looking at? Thanks, Jen. Uh, let's see. I'm glad to see we have some residents on the on the call as well. Um, Sorry, um, Ali, in the background, I forgot to mention. Um, so for those uh, for in their residency training, uh, if especially um, if first or second year, uh, the ATS offers a pediatric resident development scholarship. And I'm told there are still a few spots available. Uh, the deadline is coming up very shortly, though. They offer you a stipend and free tuition to attend the ATS, which is in DC in May. It's an unbelievable experience. And so if you're able to take advantage of that, 
um, take, oh, yeah, Ali put the link in the chat. Thank you, Ali. Uh, so definitely look at that. Uh, it's a really cool experience. Uh, technically, you need a faculty me mentor um, who's going to be there. Uh, if you don't have a mentor at your institution, uh, don't worry. Any of us on the call, I'm sure, would be happy to mentor anybody um, there. So that's pretty easy to do. Uh, so uh, getting now to Liana's question, uh, let's see. So um, how much do you think uh, where you did your fellowship? affected your choice in career path and uh, compare and contrast uh, fellowships where it's a standalone children's hospital versus a hospital within a hospital. I'm gonna start with the first part of the question because um, it's a little bit easier, I think, <laughs> for me to tackle. Um, and this was briefly mentioned by um, someone earlier. I chose my fellowship training location because I had a partner who um, had to make a decision a year in advance of me and, and I wanted us to be married and stay together. And so I ended up staying um, in New York, which was great because I'm from New York and I'm one of those people who hasn't really left New York for much time and my family is here. And um, it ended up being a great decision for me because I now have three kids and I have lots of family nearby to help with babysitting and help, uh, help me um, stay connected with, with my small children. So um, I think one of the things that often happens is that people, um, a lot of people end up in their early faculty career staying on in a place where they've trained. And so if it you're looking for a place where you ultimately want to kind of um, dig in some roots and, and maybe stay for a while, that might be one of the factors that helps you decide um, where you would want to choose a fellowship training. On the flip side, if you don't have things that are sort of tethering you to a specific location, sometimes it is nice because fellowship is a finite period of time three years to be able to go to a different part of the country or a different place um, altogether and uh, be able to experience something new and then and find a, a more um, stable place. Um, but I, I have a very New York centric vantage point on this question. So um, I'd love to hear from some of the other panelists on this. I, I think it, it matters that you align with people that you want to be around from these places. I mean, every place has its own vibe and tribe. Uh, and if there are, if, if you like want to do asthma, then line up with the place that has a strong asthma component. Doesn't mean you'll choose that, uh, but that you have the opportunity to choose it. I wouldn't choose that for, for asthma alone. I'd go and I'd, I'd say, this has a great asthma uh, uh, program, but boy, I feel great with this tribe. So, you know, not just one thing, or maybe it's where you want to be. Maybe it's location and tribe. But I, I think you have to pay attention to who you're going to spend time with. And you're going to be spending time with the people in there, their program, uh, their, their faculty, the other, the residency. What's the feel of that program? In addition, to what areas you might be interested in. And because it will, it, I think it does impact what you get exposed to. And that does probably have lifelong impacts of your career. I would agree with that. And I think this is even more um, of a challenge now in the days of virtual interviewing, uh, which I, those of us on the Peptida Committee, we've been talking about a lot over the last uh couple of years and, you know, probably some component of virtual interviewing is probably here to stay. Um, so I, I think, you know, if, if I were to go back to those of you looking at fellowships now and, and trying to figure out how do you learn really all that you need to learn about a program, a hospital, the people that are you're going to be working with, the people you're going to be working for, um, and doing that over a Zoom meeting, um, there are some inherent challenges in that. Um, fortunately, so much more is available over the internet. I think a lot of us on the fellowship side are trying to 
put as much information about our program and our trainees as we can. I think an important thing to be thinking about is what do what are the current fellows at that institution doing? Um, not just clinically, but looking at you know what are their what are their scholarly pursuits as fellows. Um, if they're all in basic science, that should tell you something. Well, hey, that's probably a focus of that fellowship program. If there's you know a, a breadth of uh, you know, basic science and uh, scholarly activities and education or quality improvement. Those are all things that you can probably get some clues on with some pretty, you know, it, it, it takes a lot of work, but you can probably do some digging um, and find a lot of that information. And then I think the other thing that I would be looking at is, you know, are you even able to find um, information about what are the graduates of that fellowship program doing? Um, and, uh, you know, that's something certainly we talk about and I encourage people who interview with our program to, you know, look at what our graduates are doing and where they are throughout, um, throughout the country and the types of jobs that they're doing. Um, but I, I think those are some of the things that, that are, you know, I would encourage people to be looking about. Um, I am, have been in an institution where there's a separate children's hospital from an adult hospital. Um, I don't have any experience in, um, you know, working in one where it's all in the same, under the same actual building. Um, I don't know if anyone else on the call may um, have that perspective to share. I, I wouldn't think that the physical structure is as big a deal as the people that you're working with. So I guess my, my two cents on that. Yeah, I work at a, a hospital with a hospital, and obviously that's the better model. No, I'm kidding. Um, I, I think I think the key is know what's what what's available. What are the resources that are available to you, no matter where you're going to either be doing your training or your as a faculty. Uh, what resources are available? What aren't available? Uh, and then uh, you'll figure out what's important uh, to you. Uh, let's see. Is Peds Jobs um, the best place to look for jobs or Glassdoor? I don't even know what Glassdoor is. Uh, so I guess this question gets to the point of where's the best place to look for jobs? <laughs> I, I'm ATS, 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 or, <laughs> or the CF conference. I mean, you if you go your second year, you should be going to one of those big conferences because it's about relationships. And you, if you're interested in a program, Ask to find the fellows because they're going to tell you. I mean, they're going to tell you <laughs> what it's like, uh, and then and and then find out who's looking for jobs. People will people will know. Go, you know, drop a note. Are are there jobs available? Uh, most universities have jobs posted, but it's hard to find. Sometimes there's a job board at ATS. So I just think um, I guess it's a plug for ATS, but it's about relationships. You get to see people, you get to meet people, you get to find their fellows and you get to ask, hey, is Colorado looking? Who's looking? And um, I know it sounds real informal, but, and there's a job board, but that's, I, I don't, we don't do this peach job thing. Is Ali able to put up the, perhaps maybe the website to link to the job board? I did want to add that we have been posting jobs on the division director's website um, through PPDA and the program directors will hear of those postings. So that's another way to find out um, places that are looking. That's a great point. Um, what um, a lot of people I, I think have um, probably never negotiated for a position before. Uh, through medical school, then residency and fellowship, there really isn't much wiggle room for salary, job, you know, uh, benefits, things like that. Uh, what do you think in your experience are things where, uh, you know, people might say everything's negotiable, but that might not be the case. Um, so where are the things that you think that but um, people probably should uh, potentially try to negotiate and, and where are areas where there just might not be as much um, wiggle room, uh, especially when you're starting out. Can I make a comment? This is Melody Pilsada. I'm from Long Island, New York. Uh, everybody can hear me, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
So I I don't think as a senior pulmonologist, we are at a position to give any advice when it comes to this, because I think we all failed. Uh, at this point, the pulmonologists are making less than a general pediatrician. And that is the reason we are all suffering and, and having hard time getting pulmonary fellows, right? I mean, the nationwide shortage in Peace Pulmonary Fellow. So we need to somehow as senior doctors get our act together and we should be making sure that people understand that, that we are needed. We do the procedures, we take care of the patients. So I, I don't know how you feel about it, but this is my opinion that it is over and over, it's coming up that, that uh, for my own faculty here, we are getting paid much less than a general pediatrician at this point. So now I wanna hear the advice from the others, good luck. Um, one of the words of advice I have is uh, sometimes it's easy if you feel like this is my dream job, my dream institution. I love everybody there. So I'm only going to go after a job there um, and to not put in the work of spreading yourself out and looking at lots of different opportunities. And I think this goes for when you're looking for a brand new job, but it also goes at different stages throughout your career um, and career development that it's important to continually look um, in different environments and sort of see because there's this mentality that the grass is always greener. And <laughs> as Melody is pointing out, it may not necessarily be that much greener in another place. And so the worst thing is to feel like you didn't do your due diligence and, and make sure that this was the absolute right opportunity. And so that is helpful when you're looking at things like trying to negotiate for salaries. If you have a couple of different job offers, then you have a couple of different salaries and you could potentially use that as leverage to um, maybe negotiate negotiate for a higher salary. If you've only been offered salary at one place, then there, you lose a little bit of your negotiating power there. Um, we talked a little bit early on about time and protected time. Um, at several institutions, um, there is a startup period where they, and a ramp up period, sorry, where they know that as a new faculty member coming in, your clinical, um, your clinical panels won't be completely full in the first few months or maybe first year or two that you're seeing patients. And so that might be an opportunity to protect for a little, to um, negotiate for a little bit more time if you wanted to develop a, pro a clinical program or if you wanted to do some pilot research or things like that to you to leverage this idea that it's going to be a slower ramp up early on for clinical. So maybe I can spend a little bit of that time um, doing something different. Oftentimes salaries are not as negotiable negotiable within an institution because many institutions are trying to you know, keep all of the, the people at different disciplines and at different stages on a similar level. So um, that might be more challenging, but thinking about other things that may not necessarily have the same financial value, like vacation time, like um, do you support attendance at conferences or do I have to pay out for that out of pocket? Are there opportunities to take coursework that is like tuition reimbursed um, that you can't exactly put a dollar on, but overall will um, increase sort of the value of that position. What other benefits? Are there tuition benefits for your kids and things like that? So um, I encourage you to think more globally about what the package is really entailing and not focus just on what is the salary that I'm taking home um, and, and also to look broadly to be able to compare those numbers and opportunities. I think that's excellent advice. I mean, uh, many programs around the country are benchmarking salaries uh, at different percent range. There's there's two there's a couple different programs that benchmark salaries for pediatric pulmonary and for sleep. So these institutions are looking at benchmarking salaries based on that and their percentiles based on where you start and how you progress through rank. So the, the negotiate how we can negotiate that is harder for us because. You don't have much wiggle room with that. Uh, but as was suggested, we're looking, I'm usually looking for ways that I can enhance your career in other ways. Uh, 
can I cover you? Can I guarantee you're going to have two weeks to study for boards? You know, things like that that do have innate value, uh, but that I that may not be directly related to your salary. Uh, so I, I think Stephanie did a nice job of thinking about what those um, what they are. So um, I'm not a, a division chief, and and I don't do the hiring. So I definitely would take my comment with a grain of salt. I, you know what I've what I've noticed is that um, the division chiefs um, might have their hands tied, right? They they, don't, they might not always be able to determine your salary, and they're the ones that go to bat for you and for their faculty. Um, having said that, you know I do feel that it is important to attempt to negotiate. It doesn't mean that you might you know, get the $10,000 extras that you think you um, deserve. But I, I do feel like there's no harm in asking. And um, none of us have good experience with negotiation. And I would recommend that you all buy this little book called Getting to Yes. Um, and it talks about your best alternative to a negotiated agreement, a BATNA. Um, and, and so it just kind of like um, organizes or creates a roadmap for you, you know, before you go into that um, negotiation. Um, and so I also would say that, um, you know, knowing that there are a lot of disparities in salary um, among women, among underrepresented in medicine, you know, I do think that if you will be able to learn who your division chief is and what they value if they try to help support you and you have the reasons to justify your ask. So for example, be educated, be informed. You know, there are two major groups. There's the AAMC who puts out public, um, you have to pay for it, but it's it's public knowledge. It's, it's out there on the internet, on the internet. It's a survey-based data based on rank and region um, in medical schools and um, academic faculty. And you will be surprised to see that the salary, um, you know, that Dr. Prasada, you know, perhaps is more familiar with in the Northeast is very different from the salary in the South or the West, right? So you also have to know um, and be educated on what is the data that is surrounding the area in which you're trying to apply for. Um, because you don't want someone to come back to you and say, why do you think you deserve X amount of money? And well, your response will be because that's the 50th percentile for rank and region in this area. And you know, so you're not coming off as, as selfish, right? You're, you're informed. And like others had said, if you have an, if you have an offer someone else, somewhere else, that's also what other institutions determine your worth might be, and that could be leverage for you as well. The other source is the MGMA, which is not as um, readily available. Um, the division chiefs might know how to access that better, but um, it's typically a green book, and I, I don't I know as much about that. Um, but you know, my point is is just be informed and be educated, and so you know, know know these things ahead of time. Yeah, and I think, remember, you don't know what you don't know. So looking at other places sometimes says, oh, maybe I should be looking for that. Or, oh, uh, that is something I can ask for. That could be a possibility. Those are really great uh, suggestions. Um, we have a couple minutes um, left here. If there are other questions, I also wanted to, um, since we do have some uh, people earlier in their uh, training on the call, uh, if you're going to be at ATS, Peptid is going to be sponsoring a session at the Center for Career Development. It's gonna be Sunday morning, bright and early at 7 a.m. I promise uh, mediocre coffee uh, and some light breakfast. And Peptid is going to be discussing how to choose a fellowship uh, and differences between programs and the like. Um, so keep that in the back of your minds as well. And uh, let's see, I don't see anything. Oh, um, I don't see anything else popping up. Um, any, any of our panelists have other thoughts um, that came to their minds as we were talking here, things that they wanted to share? Yeah, I, I do. I always have things to talk about. But anyway, <laughs> Melody, I want to talk about your comment, okay? I do think it's very important. 
Uh, I think pediatric pulmonary is the best career choice people can make. It's been a wonderful career. We're in, we're throughout the hospital. We're, we're the cement between the bricks. Unfortunately, sometimes people look at the bricks and not the cement between the bricks. Uh, and you have to be able to articulate for our specialty. Uh, sometimes people don't always understand the value because it's not clear. Uh, and, and it's not clear based on privileges. I love our hospitalists, but there's a difference in, in what we bring to the table, how we manage patients uh, in different regards, because you don't know what you don't know. Uh, it's, there's a difference in what our trainees see. Many of us, I, I assume, it's certainly true at our hospital, we, are, we have <clears throat> a huge um, uh, uh, amount of patients with technology dependent on our services. So the breadth of what we do and the amazingness of the patients we care for, not that those aren't great patients, but it's skewed. Uh, and the thinking and the research, they don't see that. They don't see those career paths. And maybe, that, maybe your chair doesn't either. So I really think it, it words matter. I like to say that words matter. How we talk about our specialty matters. And um, I'm just gonna tell you this, so you can quote it at Children's Hospital Colorado, 25% of all discharges have some breathing related DRG. And I remind people all the time, you don't wanna take care of 25% of your business, seems like not a good idea to me. Um, so we have to articulate that, that the world is getting more complex. The time in primary care office is decreasing that we are the cement that holds these complicated patients together that can make a lifelong difference in their lung function because life, lung function is the key to lifelong lung health. You notice what I'm saying? I say this, I stay on message, by the way. My fellows are gonna nod their head. I stay on this message. But it, it is important for all of us to talk like this because it's inherently not known. So Melody, I do address what you're talking about. I'm not sure it always equates to salary, but it has to equate to the importance of those who think about lung health. And that's what we do. It's a tremendous career for you residents. Uh, I love it, uh, but we have to articulate the values. Yes. Not that others aren't important, but that we're really important in this regard. Yes, so we have to get it out there that they need us. <laughs> We have to get out what our value is and, and why it's important that we're at the, at the present. Okay. Absolutely. Stephanie, go ahead. In terms of other advice for um, our young colleagues here on the call, I think we talked a lot about like finding advisors and senior mentors and things like that. But I just wanted to um, underscore another point that I found a lot of value through my career um, early career and even currently in partnering with peers and near peers. And so the networks that you belong to now, it's really nice in fellowship because oftentimes you have a class, even if it's a small class, smaller than residency, but you sort of have like built in friends that are going through this process, this journey together. Um, it feels sometimes a little bit lonelier as a junior faculty member because you don't necessarily have that built in camaraderie. So I encourage you all to build out your peer and near peer networks and to find people who are at similar career stages, who are going through similar um, things in their, whether it's a, a clinical pathway, a research pathway, an education pathway, but um, having friends in, in your field can really help buoy you through some difficult times, but also a lot of the questions and things that we've been talking about on this call about like, how did you negotiate for that? How did you get a raise? How did you get protected time? You know, the larger your network is of peers to, to bounce these questions and ideas off, the more likely you are to be successful. And, and one last note about this, um, when you have a new fellowship and you have all these bonds and relationships and you have, you, you love your mentor and then you go to your first job, it's not an ugly divorce. You can actually keep those relationships. <laughs> I did. And that was actually very helpful to me. I would even contact my fellowship um, um, mentor to discuss cases because I felt more comfortable doing that with my current team. 
until it took, you know, maybe a couple of years, I kind of transitioned out of like reaching out to my previous mentor. But, you know, we're, we're people, we, we have these relationships. And I love one of my fellows call me and up to today, and I've been out, you know, two years now, then they still contact me to discuss, you know, my area of research was in CF SPID and cystic fibrosis newborn screening. And then when they have a difficult diagnosis, they reach out to me. Mm-hmm. I love that because that means that it was a meaningful a relationship that was established and it's a friendship that will continue uh, forever, right? Hopefully. So don't feel abandoned in, or, you know, like I said, an ugly divorce. It's, it's keep your, your, your friends close to you and, and use them as, as resources for career, for negotiations, for case discussions, for advice, everything, you know, but we're here still as mentors forever. <laughs> I think that's great advice. And we all, you know, we all love what we do. We love talking about it and we love talking to other people about it. Uh, And we're here to uh, help all of you guys along your career paths, uh, no matter where you are in your training or if you're already out in the workforce. Uh, And so I think we're heading uh, to the end of the session here. Uh, I want to thank our esteemed panelists uh, and Liz and Allie and everyone from Peptida for setting this up. Uh, I think it was a great discussion. I learned a lot. I always do. And please, please, please don't hesitate with questions, uh, things that come up along your paths. Uh, I, you know, reach out, uh, whether it's uh, to me, I'm happy to uh, help liaise with people, other people on the call. Uh, please don't be shy about contacting us because we love talking about what we do and we, and we love helping other people uh, get to where they want to be and reach their full potential as well. Um, and so uh, with that, I think that we'll probably end it here. Uh, good seeing everybody and wish everyone well. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. This was great. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.